Welcome to the ICU Management and Practice Digicom. Gender in the ICU. Our Editor-in-Chief, Jean-Louis Vincent, will moderate the session. Our panelists include Francesca Rubalotta, Honorary Clinical Lecturer and Consultant in Anesthesia and Intensive Care Medicine. Antonio Artigas, Intensive Care Medicine Department and Editorial Board Member. Olfa Hamzawi, Service de Reanimacion Polyvalent Hospital Antoine Beclair. Marie Baldessieri, Professor of Critical Care Medicine and Neurocritical Care. Sheila Nainan Mayatra, Professor of Critical Care Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care. Let us now welcome the moderator of today's DigiConf, John Louis Vincent. Very good. Uh, it's nice to see these beautiful uh, pictures. Um, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this um, discussion on a very important topic the uh, topic of um, uh, gender. And um, we will um, have uh, a, the panel that has been uh, presented uh, to us one minute ago. I hope you can uh, hear me. You can hear me? Uh, no? Yes? OK. Because uh, the images are moving a little bit. And uh, we will, uh, we will uh, first present the apologies of uh, Marie Baltasieri, but she is very busy in her department in Pittsburgh with many COVID-19 patients. So she, she just sent a note to apologize, but of course she doesn't want to leave her patients and we can uh, understand that. So uh, we clearly uh, understand the, the situation. Uh, so the, uh, the, the hour will be uh, split in two. First, we will ask our four panelists to give an introductory comment about the aspects he or she would like to emphasize. And the second half will be open to discussion with question and answers from the audience, from I suppose many readers of ICU management and practice an excellent publication. <laughs> so I will leave, I will continue, I will uh, introduce people according to the order that has been assigned to us. And so indeed, uh, Francesca uh, Rubilotta from London, you will, uh, you will start, please. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Thank yes. you so much, Valerie. I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, yeah, it is. So hopefully you're now seeing my slides. Yeah. Fantastic. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for such a lovely introduction. I think more than a comment, being the first speaker, I wish to bring some initiatives that have been uh, taken over the last couple of years. And then I will let the other panelists to talk about uh, uh, thoughts, feelings, and uh, news. So uh, recently uh, we created a not-for-profit organization called I Win. I obviously have no real direct conflict of interest, but I'm the chair of such an organization. So please apologize if I am far too enthusiastic about that. But let's challenge my enthusiasm by asking the question, why should we have such a thing in 2021 or even in 2022? Well, let me tell you about this concept. Let me tell you about what we did in the past and we are doing as we speak. And let me tell you a few words about the future. The concept is not new. I think it has started a couple of years ago and to pick up a day probably was 2017 when we started feeling that we wanted to share our experience and to learn from each other about what we do and we think we can improve in the field of gender and I might add uh, minorities and diversity because we know gender is the tip of an iceberg that includes a lot 
of uh, other issues that we might want to explore if uh, Jean-Louis wishes later in the discussion. So starting from 2017, we continue to talk about how to uh, uh, set up such a discussion and we created this networking platform. Indeed, the International Women in Intensive and Critical Care Network is just a way to link uh, different organizations involved in um, matters related to gender and minorities. And we uh, are now collaborating with several organizations, universities, societies, but we we moved to be broader than that. We just didn't want to include intensive care. And currently, we are now collaborating with uh, uh, companies and organizations in the field of business and entrepreneur and engineering because the problems sometimes are very similar and solutions seem to be similar. We identified challenges in education, challenges in research, and challenges in the system. What does it mean? Let me give you a practical example. We believe that the system can be easily changed so that uh, people that suffer in their career advance can easily be brought and um, create such a network that might in the long term help them through their life. So for instance, a conference when ever we will go back to a residential conference that does not provide childcare excludes by default a well-defined group of people that in their 30s potentially could set up a good network for the rest of their career. Similarly, a residential meeting that does not allow networking opportunities in the afternoon but keeps those out of hours might select again uh, in a group of people excluding others that could be easily uh, helped by just a change in the system and the way that things are done. So what we are now doing and what we did in the past, we tried to stay focused and to find solutions. We set up a residential mm -hmm. hybrid conference. We start collaborating with other organizations mm -hmm. uh, such as We Care. We are starting a pilot sponsorship program and we are working, uh, how, trying to help women in Afghanistan. What is that we did in the past? So we start with our first meeting in the uh, correspondence of the uh, declaration of the not-for-profit organization. And this was attended by 200 people in nearly 40 countries. This was different because we set up thematic tables instead of large audience. Reason being that we believe that minorities and women feel more comfortable working in small groups results are clearer and potentially publishable. Those eight tables indeed were led by experienced chairs. Those chairs made a summary of the day. This was discussed in the assembly the day after, leading to a consensus that we are very busy starting uh, writing up and hopefully publishing. We use set templates, and even the material that we provided was accredited and the people attending the two days work received uh, seven credits from the ACME. What we will do in the future? Well, we have a junior committee and I'm very proud. The junior committee chair is also the chair of We Care that is now collecting money from five different universities in the United States to help children not to get married, but to get to school. It's clear that the bottleneck is in a child access to education, in a woman access to career opportunities. And we are collaborating to fight and to help women through those bottleneck. And then I think they can fly. They don't need to be out for the rest of their life. What did we do for Afghanistan is set, setting up together with several other organizations a document of commitment related to our field of competences and spreading this through a video. I don't know whether the technology can allow me to show you the beginning of such a video. So I might need to have some help for that. And then with that potential, I will be concluding. So is anyone able to support me presenting the beginning of this video or should I try to do that myself? Okay, let me try if I'm able to do such a thing. Can you hear? Seven. 
several organizations around the world have signed their commitment. We have made this video to share with you the content of such a document. We wish to support Afghanistan in within our competences. These include medicine and the care of critical ill patients. We wish to support our colleagues, doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals engaged in Afghanistan. Here are our commitments. So these will be uploaded on our website soon and hopefully will be able to be shared with you. With all these examples, we think to make a change. We felt at the beginning that we just should do nothing because it was impossible. And now we start feeling that we can do it because nothing is impossible. And with this, we wish to invite you next year to our conference, which we hope is going to be residential. And it will be still done in small groups, supporting families and having childcare and changing the networking opportunities to allow all category to be included. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca. That's uh, interesting. It's good to see this uh, uh, dynamic uh, movement uh, in uh, defending uh, the female uh, gender in medicine, but everywhere, including in Afghanistan, which is uh, clearly uh, very timely and very important. I must say so, other, other speakers in this conference have been in this video and have been contributing actively. So I'm just presenting something we shared that we did together. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So the next in line is uh, Antonio Artigas, who was introduced before. So Antonio, my friend, the floor is yours. You are still on mute. Please unmute yourself. You are right. Hello, hello, John Louis. Thank you for your introduction and to be here and participate in this webinar. I will share uh, the information here. Okay. Okay. So that uh, I will try to do and summarize uh, in uh, some minutes the, uh, the topic on the gender and research. And I will uh, follow uh, these uh, three or four points uh, is the sex differences in grant funding. That is very important. The uh, research, the gender in clinical research and in clinical research and some uh, message at the end. So if you look on the, uh, the sex differences in institution support for junior biomedical researcher, you see that this is our data from uh, the NEH. And you can see that uh, there are huge differences between men and women. Uh, in the PhD, but also in the first uh, uh, quartile of NEH uh, funding, with uh, you see the huge differences of amount of money in between uh, different sex. Let's get this. Uh, one of the potential reasons uh, is not the, the quality of the project, because uh, if you see here the Funding success by the grant program, uh, you see there are, not, there are not very important uh, differences, but the differences are mainly uh, due uh, to the, uh, the components of the juries that are selecting uh, the, the, uh, the projects. Uh, if you compare the first uh, uh, selection, and then the final selection, you see that there are uh, important differences uh, between both genders. And, uh, and also, if you look on the, the amount of resource uh, requirement and the number or percentage of grants received by females, uh, there is a, 
an inverse uh, correlation. So the higher is the amount required, the lower is the uh, the, the success to get uh, grants. So that, I think it's uh, this is important, and uh, this was also uh, considered by uh, the European Union, uh, where uh, there are, uh, in spite that the, the, there is a di diminishing. Uh, the differences uh, by gender in, in research, but are still uh, uh, are important differences uh, on uh, gender equality. And uh, the European Union, especially in the horizon 2021 22, uh, they want to have or to promote a gender balance and equal opportunity in project teams at all levels. And uh, these are the recommendations. Uh, so they want to have an equilibrium or balance between the both genders in the evaluation and the advisory uh, committees to uh, make a decision uh, and to select uh, the different uh, uh, research uh, submitted program. But also, uh, they want that, that the uh, participation of the women in the in the project uh, work for, uh, workforce uh, increase. Uh, the gender also is, a, is an important factor of death in the ICU. This is an example uh, from the clinical point of view of the COVID-19 meta-analysis. And you see that uh, Patients, male patients, uh, have a higher risk of death compared with a woman. And uh, one of the potential explanation uh, could be the differences in the H uh, angiotensin conversion enzyme two. Uh, females they have a lower level of this enzyme, and you know this is. Uh, is a key point uh, to uh, uh, for the COVID infection uh, to be disseminated in, uh, in, in the, among the patients. So again, another example from clinical research uh, from the uh, RDS long safe study, uh, the uh, male patients uh, have a, a, um, a lower probability of survival compared with uh, with uh, female. And finally, and this is uh, my last slide, uh, the preclinical uh, studies is exactly the same. So um, uh, that means that uh, we need in the future uh, to consider the sex of the uh, preclinical and clinical studies uh, um, to uh, uh, to be sure that the results can be extrapolated to all the uh, ICU population. In this example, this is a, a study in the preclinical study of uh, a model of uh, pulmonary fibrosis. And you see the female and male, there are uh, huge differences from the histological uh, point of view. So in conclusion, I think we need uh, for gender equality in research opportunities, especially for young uh, uh, physicians. Uh, the sex differences in management and outcome is important to be considered in the and to incorporate this in the designs of uh, clinical trials. And I think we need uh, sex specific guidelines uh, for future studies. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm open for any questions or discussions that I'm sure uh, uh, will come. Thank you, thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Antonio. Um, I think it's um, it's interesting. You presented some uh, very interesting uh, data, and as you say, that will generate some uh, interesting questions, I'm sure. So let's move to the uh, next uh, speaker, who is Olfa Amzawi. And uh, Olfa, if you are ready, yeah, à toi. Allons-y. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm really very, very glad to be um, among and honored to be um, among this uh, panel of speakers and to speak about something which is uh, 
very near to my heart, the gender inequity and the friendship. I will try very quickly to present to you the, the French experience. And I will begin by just giving you the state of the art because we published in uh, last year in the Annals of Intensive Care, a questionnaire uh, that uh, we sent for uh, the uh, SRLF members from June to uh, August 2019. This questionnaire comprised 41 questions and five eight items about demographic, private life characteristics, work positions. Being a female, uh, does it impact the career advancement, perceived discrimination at work and suggestion to improve female? It was sent to 732 women doctors from the SRLF mailing uh, list and we had 30, 371 respondents. These, these are the main characteristics. They were uh, mainly young women uh, between 30 and 40 years old. They were uh, mainly also in couple with children, 44%, and more than two uh, children for each uh, woman. And um, mainly we had uh, uh, academic women uh, with no academic position and less than 20% were in academic position. And I just mean by tenured and non-tenured, this, um, this number is just overestimating the real the reality in the intensive care uh, speciality because we, we have only 8% of the uh, among the professors that are women. And so also, uh, another interesting result is about the hard working in intensive care and they we had uh, just a mean um, working hours per day of 10 hours uh, mainly they were working between 40 and 6 hours per week uh, they had um, night shifts for more than 4 per week and they had between 1 and 2 weekends uh, per month and if we look at to the time dedicated to research mainly 66% of the respondent had uh, no time for uh, research research per week and even for uh, women who uh, were responding and having academic position 40% uh, had no time not enough time for research and um, well, the striking results is that over 46% uh, quoted their quality of life equal or lower than six and um, the feeling is that 30% uh, they just um, express that being a woman is a barrier in the intensive care uh, advancement and 80% uh, just expressed also that pregnancy may be a barrier to academic advancement of women intensivists. Another more scaring result is that uh, about humiliation and bullying in the workplace and 45% had already um, experienced the humiliation uh, thirty-six percent bullying and sexual harassment for fifty-six uh, sexual uh, among the bullying in the workplace. There were uh, fifty-six percent of sexual harassment and forty-four percent of moral harassment. And so, uh, we just decided in the French society to act, and uh, we began by uh, uh, just con uh, constituting a working group, which is the FEMIR within the French Society of Intensive Care (SRLF). 12 members, 10 women and two men, 10 intensive and two external guests. And we had uh, just um, some objectives uh, to conduct a reflection to promote equity within the SRLF and the College of Intensive Care teachers in order to better represent and amplify the voice of women in our specialty. We, are, we, had, we aimed also changing working conditions for women in order to best adapt them to a satisfactory quality of personal life and to improve the attractiveness of intensive care for young doctors. And so the first action was uh, the better representation of women in our speciality. And what we did is that in the College of in, uh, Intensive Care Teachers, we proposed quotas among teachers of the college, teaching and mentorship. Among the French Society of Intensive Care, the working group is represented by a member of the executive committee and there was a real participation to the general policy of our society. We voted also recently equity for the representation among women and men for the executive committee. And we put in place a strategy to target equity for the coming two years in different committees of the SRLF. Among the available positions, female candidates were priorities 
size and in a proportion of them, and we voted also quotas for the female speakers and chairs in our national congress in order to help the organization committee, we established a list of women experts in each field based on their reference publication. We also initiated uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, movement about uh, the editorial boards and uh, for our journal, which is the Annals of Intercept Care, the journal of our society, we uh, just uh, also uh, uh, wanted and um, uh, explain, expressed the uh, willing to have an annual announcement of the proportion of women in the editorial board and the, an annual announcement of the proportion of women authors in the published papers as first or senior authors. The second action was to put in place sessions around equity in order to raise awareness about this issue among our community. And uh, this was done in our uh, in our uh, seminars in uh, the College of Intensive Care Teachers this year uh, among the programs is the first time that we speak about that issue in our uh, college. Also in our national program, uh, we had two sessions organized by our working group around gender inequity. And also it is a first initiation. We also uh, put in place some uh, uh, pedagogical pedagogical information tool around the issue of inequalities, as well as the various studies, scientific and sociocultural, in order to sensitize uh, people about, uh, about the problem. And uh, is that me? Yes, sorry. The third action was to initiate training sessions targeting endogenous reasons that may prevent mainly women to accede to leadership positions. And we put in place uh, for uh, workshops in order to uh, train for self-esteem, lack of confidence, and conscious bias. We also, uh, the fourth action, uh, we just targeted to improve the attractiveness of our specialty among young doctors and to promote role models. So more speakers and chairs in the Congress, more women among the executive committee, and more teachers and mentors and also in our website page, we uh, just also uh, put in place website interviews of uh, models uh, of women intensivists with different career pathways, different profiles and different personalities in order to give a real concept uh, perspective for the young generation. And so, I don't know why it's not, uh... I cannot just move my slide, yes. The fifth action was to develop working conditions and unit organization in order to best adapt them to a balanced personal quality of life. And uh, we just were based on these suggestions in our uh, survey that we, uh, uh, we published recently. And the most um, suggestions that were made by 111 women were uh, to allow part-time adapt working hours, increase number of course of intensivists per uh, ICU, and to have measures related to maternity and paternity leaves, improve also childcare availability, availability for children intensivists, and of course the ban gender harassment. All these measures are really more global and they need ministerial and societal uh, measures. This is why we uh, just, uh, uh, want to uh, touch the decision makers and to integrate the decision, the discussion table within the government. And we, we are trying to have a large campaign to present the group, its actions, missions, and demand. We just uh, recently published uh, this editorial in the uh, critical care, and we summarized all the actions and the, the concrete action that we can put in place in order to improve uh, gender inequity in intensive care. So what's next? Next is to promote women academic careers begin by young, beginning by young generation as they are proportionally equivalent to 40 to 50% of the intensivists are less than 40 years old now in our society. So we need a real mentorship, including them in a research program early, encourage them to candidate for key positions in the national society, including the, in their uh, training courses, unconscious bias, leadership, problems of gender, inequity to raise their awareness very early. 
We want also to encourage coaches in the leadership positions in medical directors, presidents, and general secretary of uh, uh, our national institutions and colleges and chairs in the committees, and to put in place regular tools to evaluate systematically all the actions we implemented. And I want to finish just to show you our website page in the SLF, um, SLF uh, uh, Society and our uh, PIMIR page uh, in, um, in the website of the SRLF with all what I just tried to summarize in a few minutes. And thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Antra. That, uh, that was also very interesting uh, to listen to the French experience and in particular in the uh, French intensive care society and um, to see the things that you could um, list, identify and uh, uh, develop. And, uh, that's uh, certainly interesting and, you know, raising the, the, the question what are the reasons for all this? Uh, that's certainly uh, very important. And we will come back to that during the discussion time. So, Sheila from Mumbai, you were introduced before. And now the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor jean -Louis. I hope you can hear me. I'll just try to share. Yep, this. yep, yep, yep. Uh, I, I have been disabled to share my screen, if I can just get some assistance for that. I think, Olfa, you have to... Yes, yeah. Sorry about that. I hope you can see my screen. Hello, yeah. everybody, and uh, greetings from the Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, India. Uh, I'm very delighted to be part of this. And at the outset, I'd like to thank Professor Jean-Louis Vassot for giving me the opportunity to participate in this uh, round table. Uh, recently, uh, while preparing for this piece, along with uh, Dr. Francesca Rubalota on working uh, in the pandemic and preserving uh, diversity, uh, I got the opportunity to uh, you know, get more insights about diversity in the uh, intensive care unit. And I'm going to be speaking to this about this in the next few minutes. So if you look at diversity, what is diversity? I'm going to speak about whether it, does it really matter? What is the status of diversity in critical care of medicine today? And what is really the way forward for us? Now, if you ask me, what is diversity? By definition, it's a condition of having many different elements. Now, when we talk about diversity, it's not only about gender. We are talking about pe having people from different geographical regions, ethnicity, sexual orientation, people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, multi-professionalism from different academic fields, cultural and religious. And this is what we really mean by diversity. It's not just about gender. So does this really make a difference? Why are we talking about diversity? Among clinicians, it gives you a different perspective there can be a better understanding, increased creativity, and also protect, uh, you know, productivity and improved decision making when you have a diverse team of clinicians. What about with respect to uh, patients? Does it make a difference? We have enough data to support that it facilitates better communication. It improves patient satisfaction with care. And it's also been seen that patients, uh, you know, uh, provided from underserved underrepresented minority communities are more likely to serve uh, patients from underserved backgrounds. And in the academic settings, what's most important is work produced by diverse re research teams may be of higher quality and more impactful than those produced by a uh, lesser diverse team. So definitely we have data to support that this is really important. And I'll give you a few uh, examples of some uh, published data. Now, this is a very interesting survey that was conducted in the United States by the California Medical Board. Almost 50,000 Finnish physicians were interviewed. And what was very really interesting is they looked at the work preferences among these physicians, and they found that minority physicians were more likely than their counterparts to work in underserved communities to care for minorities, poor and uninsured patients. 
Uh, this really means that we need to improve healthcare for underserved communities through continued efforts, and we need to increase physician diversity, and this is extremely um, essential. And there's lots more work on that. If you look at just patient-centered communication, ratings of care, this is another survey, and this was done in 15 urban centers, again in the United States. And what they did is about 250 adults, and these were both African-American patients and white patients, and these were receiving care from 31 physicians of different races. And what the African-American patients who visited the patients of the same race found that their medical visits were more satisfying, participatory, than when they saw physicians from other races. So there was gender, you know, a gender a race concordance. So definitely increasing ethnicity among physicians may be one of the most direct strategies to improve the healthcare experiences for men members, especially of these ethnic minorities. And more recently, you have more and more about uh, satisfaction and communication uh, between races and ethnicity when there is concordance. And this was a nationwide study that was conducted in the United States. And they looked at, uh, you know, the question they asked is that, is doctor-patient race concordance associated with greater satisfaction? And it was interesting to see that among each race and ethnic group, respondents were uh, reported greater satisfaction with their physician when there was race concordance. And these findings definitely suggest that we should increase the minority physician. But I think the more important message from this finding is that you should improve the ability of physicians to interact with patients who are not of the same race. And this will really be the way forward in this area. How about nurses? Now, this is a very interesting uh, you know, survey that was published, and this was done in Europe among European intensive care nurses. And it looked at uh, nurses across 15 countries, more than uh, 500 nurses. And they looked at cultural competency among nurses. Does this really uh, change and make a difference to patient care and patient satisfaction? And what they found is that nurses who were exposed to you know, cultural diversity in different ways had multicultural uh, uh, you know, exposure or spoke a second language or visited other countries, they can actually influence the cultural competencies. And they definitely felt this was a very important part to have multicultural clinical practice and encourage this among the nurses. Now, what about doctors and fellows? Now, this is a study that was, uh, you know, where they looked at data over 10 years from 2004 to 2014. And they looked at diversity in emerging critical care workforce. And this was done in the United States. And they published data to create logistic regression models and compared the annual trend of representation of women and people from different races and ethnicity in critical care fellowships. And what did they find? They found that the demographics of the emerging critical care physician workforce reflect underrepresentation of women and racial ethnic minorities. And it's very important that future research uh, is required to elucidate the reasons why there is this underrepresentation of people from racial and ethnic minorities in critical care uh, fellowship program. And I'm sure you've all seen this uh, paper that was published in critical care on women in intensive care. And uh, Dr. Hamzavi has already spoken a lot about gender, so I'll just touch on this. And this is looking, this was an international study published by Dr. Bala Venkatesh and Dr. Sanjay. Uh, preliminary international data on female representation in the intensive care unit. And it's very uh, interesting. This was data from the uh, college, Australia and New Zealand College. And if you look at the fellows or uh, you look at the examiners, over 10 years, there has been a rise, but this has been a very slow kind of rise that has uh, been there in the female representation. And what's more interesting is if you look at the leadership positions, if you look at people who are in councils and board members, if you look across the various societies, and this is the percentage representation of women, so there is much scope for improvement. And what really struck my attention was the presidents among the various critical care societies. And I was interested to note that ESICM has not had a single female president. And I am very proud and honored that I was elected to be uh, the president-elect of the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine, which will have a first female president after 28 years. So there's a lot we need to do really for the gender, but I think what it really needs is a change in the mindset, a change in the approach. We need to sponsor, you know, promote sponsorship versus just mentoring. Our mindset has to change. It shouldn't be, uh, have you tried to apply? You should ask to be a speaker. It should be changed to, I recommend you for this speech. 
and we should try to encourage women to expose them to uh, you know people who can help them and sponsor them and continue to continue their growth and retaining them in critical care. I think this is very important, and this was very beautifully summarized recently by Professor Jean Louis Vasso and uh, Francesca. Uh, Rubilata in this uh, article in Critical Care, which was published, where they looked at uh, you know different methods and different approaches at various levels that could be addressed uh, to uh, you know address this gender imbalance in, um, in critical care, whether it was in institutional, um, you know, to to have change in policies, educational, increase the you know um, narrow the, the pay gap between males and females. So various levels and also, uh, you know, uh, concrete measures, publishing dynamics, and try to eliminate the biases that exist in, uh, in order to improve um, the, uh, wide narrow the gap in the gender imbalance. And this has also been published by the, in the Blue Journal by Sangeeta Mehta, uh, Dr. Sangeeta Mehta, who proposed various, uh, who gave uh, various proposals on how we can uh, address the gender parity in uh, critical care medicine. So a lot of concrete approaches to what uh, can be done in this area. And in 2018, the ASICM task force for diversity and equality was also established. I was I'm very honored and proud to be a part of this committee. And this was the first draft of a policy paper uh, for the conduct related to gender, uh, gender identity, age, sexual orientation, et cetera, that we looked at. And we started by publishing a statement paper on the diversity uh, for the ESICM. And you can see over the last 10 years, how if you look at the membership, uh, uh, you know, on the representation of women has increased. And if you look at the age groups, you'll see more and more younger women coming. And this is, uh, you, you know, in the next committee, and you can see the representation across uh, various global regions and the male and female uh, proportion. So it does leave, there is, uh, it has definitely improved over time, but we do have a lot of areas where we could improve the representation of women in the community. And the ESICM has formed uh, different working groups to address various uh, aspects of gender diversity, ethnicity, and also multi-professionalism. And I'd like to end uh, with this uh, very nice statement from the National Institute of Health and where they've addressed the science of diversity. And this is a very nice article and a piece that I read, and uh, they emphasize that workforce diversity is a scientific opportunity. And uh, the important key points that they say that you should identify psychological and social factors that mitigate individual and institutional barriers to workforce diversity. So the first step is, of course, to identify the problem and then you can rectify it. And what's more important is to develop a scalable strategy so you can measure this and effectively disseminate and sustaining diversity within the nation nationwide scientific workforce uh, is, uh, I think, a very, very important uh, agenda. I'd like to end by saying that diversity in ICU has several benefits. It gives a different perspective, better understanding. It increases creativity, productivity. It also improves your decision making among clinicians, and it also translates into better patient care. As a critical care community, I think it is our collective responsibility to identify and address the barriers that to establish diversity in critical care. And I think future research should focus on identifying these gaps and better strategies to improve uh, diversity in the intensive care. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila. This was uh, really uh, superb. And um, you can, uh, yeah, you can uh, stop your projection. We will now have a good 10 minutes of uh, discussion of these uh, presentations. And um, uh, I remind the audience that everyone can send some uh, questions in the, uh, in the chat uh, uh, space. Uh, of course, our discussion will try to remain relatively centered around ICU management and practice, as this is the, uh, the title of our journal, where we can find the articles that we refer to during these uh, presentations. But um, it's important to remind ourselves that at the end of medical school, um, at least in, uh, in Europe, uh, there is a quite substantial majority of, uh, of women 
close to two thirds of uh, medical graduates are female. And um, when you look then at the leadership positions and the teaching positions in our various disciplines, before we focus on ICU, in our various disciplines, as uh, it was emphasized this afternoon, uh, there are relatively um, little, uh, a relatively small proportion of, of women remaining there. So we need to question why, what are these barriers? And uh, as it was alluded to, it could be in part related to organization and how to preserve uh, the, um, how to preserve the, um, the quality of life of, uh, of people. So, um, Francesca, a general comment about this. Uh, do you think, do you have some explanations for the progressive decrease in the proportion of women as we go up in the pyramid of uh, our hospitals or medical schools? Thank you so much. It is uh, multifactorial, I think, the problem. And uh, indeed, uh, the things that strikes me the most in this oh. webinar is that every single person presenting has been looking for solutions. And uh, the approach is very positive, I guess, uh, bringing up ways to make a change and to uh, do effective uh, initiatives that might change this in the near futures. I suspect sometimes it's the women's fault so that we do not apply for jobs. If we do not apply, of course, we're never going to get jobs. And so having leaders like Sheila and Holfa presenting uh, their stories as a role model is really fundamental. So we set up and forgot a YouTube channel where we get people to present five minutes what made the difference in their life and to make realizing people that they can achieve what they want by different strategies. The second is unconscious bias. And this several times is no one's fault, but discussing and raising them makes a change itself. And I'm very grateful to ICU management and practice because I think what you have done is a big step. You're raising the discussion, you're promoting a really equal approach to these issues. And finally, the system. And I'm a strong believer that if you design that in a little bit different way, just you can connect, talk to people, spend some time, and then find, oh, look at that. She's quite clever, by the way. Why don't we give a, a lecture next year? So this is my vision, but let's hear what the other people think. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Olfa, you, you touched on, on, on quota. Uh, do you think there should be quota within scientific societies, editorial boards, and perhaps in clinical departments, especially in critical care medicine, as we will now focus more on critical care medicine? Uh, yes, thank you for, for your question. It's really a very complicated to, to answer this question because um, uh, actually I'm, I'm not really uh, the first uh, approach for this, um, of this uh, problem. I was not really for quotas. But uh, all the factors that um, Francesca just uh, uh, talked about, uh, the, and, and the, the most important, the last one, which is the unconscious bias, uh, may, and the, 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 the mind of the, of the society that, are, that, that these um, positions are traditionally, traditionally for men, May, 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 makes me uh, just to be convinced that quotas are really now necessary uh, to, uh, to have the, uh, the, the, the insurance that, and to be just sure that the um, uh, women will be included in the right positions and the, in the key positions. Because um, as you just, uh, just told very, very well, uh, the the story, uh, Jean-Louis, because uh, you said it's we are, we are two thirds of women in the medical students, and uh, when we arrive to uh, teachers, professors, and we are just very, very, very little, very small, very so, few, mm -hmm. very few, and so there is a there is a, a problem, and uh, it is very complicated to resolve 
uh, just now uh, quickly without putting in place quotas in um, of course for i think like like just i presented also in my presentation in the french society we put quotas in the committees in the executive committee and in the colleges uh, and among the speakers and, uh, in in order to just um, make people think about uh, the women uh, that can be a speaker in the place of the traditional man that he speaks every year for uh, the same subject. And uh, we just also tried to help them. For example, we helped the scientific uh, uh, committee of the organization of our Congress, and we gave them uh, a list of uh, experts with their publication in the field. So we just also uh, uh, justified their place in the, uh, in the Congress. And, uh, and so this is why we put also, uh, we put quotas. Sure. Now, I didn't want to focus only on Congresses. Uh, it's also you know, teaching in intensive care. Yeah. I don't know how many uh, women teach intensive care in the medical schools. Uh, and it could be even in the clinical departments. Should we have a minimum yeah. uh, number of women in our departments? Uh, Sheila, do you think it should go that way? Right. Uh, so I have a little different take on this, actually. I'm not really for quotas. I would, I would think you need to really ask yourself, why are we having less women? Rather than say, just place more women everywhere and have more percentages. And the reason is because women, when they're peaking at their career and trying to do things, they're also trying to have their families. They're also trying to, uh, you know, work around their life uh, and everything is happening together. And this increases tremendous stress among women. And this is the reason uh, careers like uh, critical care medicine, which are very labor intensive and stressful, uh, become difficult. Women, uh, you know, opt out of it or don't want to do it. And this is where I think we should make the difference by supporting them. I wouldn't say quotas, but you need to support women. You need to help them at a time and make your work environment conducive. Because if you look at uh, you know, knowledge, competency, I don't see a woman being any less uh, than yeah. a man anywhere in the world. So why Very are we good. talking about reservations and quotas? I think what we should be talking about is support the woman, make the work environment conducive. So she also has an equal opportunity. You have a man and a woman for an interview who are equally good. Maybe give, give the woman a chance. You know, yeah. something like this rather than say, because I, I feel very insulted when people put me on committees saying, oh, you're a woman, so, you know, we need a woman, so we need to take you. You know, yeah. I think we are no less. And I think we should, you know, we have merit, but we need to be supported. I think- Thank you. Time, we need to shorten a little bit the, uh, the question time because the time is running. Antonio, uh, someone asks, do you think that gender diversity improves patients' outcome? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you think on uh, on gender, uh, the outcomes are not the same uh, uh, if you compare males and females. That is, uh, I'm sure. And that means that in the future, we need uh, uh, some guidelines uh, for, to design the future uh, clinical trials. Uh, because uh, the results could be influenced um, by the differences or the differences in the distribution of the gender patients. Uh, okay. If you allow me, uh, I fully agree with the comment, the last comment of uh, Sheila. Yeah. I, I like very much uh, this uh, view because, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, in, in Barcelona, in, the, my, in my university, 80% of the medical students are, are women, are females. That's so, what we said, yeah, that's yeah. what we said. But, but yeah. that means, uh, I think uh, we are coming from a, an histor historical uh, position that uh, it, it was not, uh, cannot be sustained today. Uh, and I'm sure that it's a problem, probably it's a temporary problem, as uh, Olfa mentioned, that today, and this was also the decision of the European Union. We need to uh, to try to keep a balance uh, between the different sex in uh, committees uh, to select uh, 
grants. Yeah, but what balance? You, you cannot go directly to 50, 50 percent. No, no, right? no, no. It's just to be sure that it is not, uh, you know, as it is now 20 percent females and 80 percent males. That, 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 that is. So how, how, how do you fix these percentages? Well, I, I, I think uh, you need to, to have uh, uh, quite, uh, I mean, acceptable balance based Based, based mainly by the quality of this, by the scientific quality. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, uh, this, I think, uh, uh, and I, I don't agree just only because of the gender differences, et cetera, et cetera. I prefer to, to have a view from the scientific point of view, but, uh, but this should be respected, you know, and, and it's not the case until now. Probably will change in the next future, but uh, we need to help uh, yep. uh, uh, women that are uh, working in, in critical care, as uh, Sheila uh, mentioned. I fully agree with uh, her comment. Uh, we need, if you don't change and you don't help uh, uh, the atmosphere and the facilities to work in critical care, uh, then uh, you will not solve the problem. Very important point that we will keep for uh, now for the our last uh, comments. But uh, someone asks here: Do you think that women perceive critical care medicine as stressful? Should we try to make it less stressful, Francesca? Yeah, we should. Otherwise, the specialty will expire, as mentioned, because uh, it's not attractive. <laughs> And how to increase, to answer your question, is by training women to be more ambitious and uh, men to overcome unconscious bias during the interviews. Because unfortunately, there's many and it's uh, no one fault. And then finally- Should we do something to improve the organization, Alpha, uh, to take care of your children? You have a small child yourself. Do you think we should uh, make sure that uh, men and women uh, share more the the burden of uh, all this, uh, as yeah, we yeah. could see on, on one slide. Yeah, 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 because there are a lot of, uh, of course, of, of things we can do for, for women to support, as Sheila said, to support them for, uh, for example, the equal time for uh, leaves for maternity and paternity leaves, for example, in France, it's not the case. Uh, so we, we keep the couple choose if the man or the woman can uh, take care of the, uh, of the child. The child care improve in the hospitals where you are, uh, where you are working. Uh, also, there are some uh, propositions in USA. I didn't, I didn't have time to present the paper, but there is a, a nice correspondence in the Lancet last year that uh, was dealing about um, uh, the, uh, the task force that were uh, implemented in some universities, in uh, Columbia University, in some uh, uh, medical faculties. And uh, there were some uh, uh, task force uh, that were uh, given to deans of the faculties and among them the these all uh, things to do for uh, for the women and also to just stop the promotion uh, uh, clock uh, for uh, a while when uh, women need needs to also and not to just um, punish the woman because she's pregnant and she has uh, some difficulty to continue to have a continuous uh, career advancement very good. Sheila, the last words for you. What is your biggest wish? What do you think should really change? Right. So I, I personally think women are multitaskers. They're very strong and they handle stress very well. I think critical care is a very well suited career and they naturally select the women who go into critical care are the ones who really want to. Personally, from my experience, I really feel that you can do some adjustments. You can, you can have committees to support. Okay, what does this woman need? How can I help her perform better? Because when they get that support at the right time, they can perform much better later when their responsibilities are taken care of. And I like Alpha's point about um, you know, paternity leave, maternity leave. These, you know, these are things that committees should look at and not just about reservation and quotas and things like this. So I think this is the way forward and we should really try to, you know, it's, it's time we get over increasing awareness. We have to acknowledge that there's a problem and now we have to look at concrete solutions for action. 
Excellent. We could continue this discussion for, for a long time, but I think, you know, we all agree that diversity is really extremely important and there is no way to go against it. So we need to envisage the way to change mentalities first, I think, and then from there, change the organization, uh, promote those who need to be uh, promoted and make a better world with a bigger place for female physicians or scientists or uh, uh, healthcare workers. So I wish to thank you very, very much. I think it was very interesting. Thank you. Again, we can read more in ICU management and practice, and we will certainly see you soon elsewhere. So thank, thank you, you and take care. Thank you. Bye, Jean-Louis. Thank you. Bye. Bye.